Hey, it's Clay. Welcome to another video. Today, we are going to take an overly deep dive into the Electra Distortion Circuit. It is a very old and very simple and very basic uh, overdrive distortion fuzz type circuit. We're going to take a look at the schematic. We're going to talk about what every component in the schematic does. And then I'd really like to do kind of a deep dive into playing around with those components on a breadboard. Uh, this is a perfect circuit to breadboard and a really where when you have such minimal components, each component does quite a lot to change the tone. So I want to dive into that and we can hear all the little differences that each component is doing and hopefully learn quite a lot about some of these kind of building block concepts of overdrive, distortion, and fuzz pedals. So if you're interested in that, go ahead and stick around. Let's dive right in. Okay, this is a schematic for the Electra Distortion. Now, um, there are kind of a lot of different versions of this, and so whether or not every single one of these specific components is accurate may or may not be true, so I apologize about that. But I do think that this general topology and layout is accurate, and so I want to go through each component and talk a little bit about what it is all doing. So it's all centered around this transistor here in the middle. This is a NPN bipolar junction transistor. Uh, this one is listed as a 2N3904, but there are a lot of them that you could possibly use. Any kind of transistor really could probably be used here. Now, uh, this 2N3904 is a very, very widely available, inexpensive silicon NPN audio transistor. Um, there are millions of them out there doing basic audio application in the world, and for this per first circuit, it will actually work great. Um, you have three pins. This You have the collector on the top, the bass in the middle, and the emitter on the bottom. In order to make this an amplifier circuit, you want to put audio into the uh, bass, and then it exits out the collector. So that's kind of the general idea of what's going on here. Let's take a look at the specific components, though. So we have the input coming in here on the left. The input goes through a capacitor, C1. This is at 0.1 UF microfarads. Now, um, the input capacitor does a couple things. First of all, we have a DC power supply source. And that DC voltage is present here in the middle of the circuit. We don't want that DC moving backwards. If you, for example, if you're plugging into this pedal from your guitar, you don't want to introduce that DC onto that wire to go through your cable back up into your guitar. Um, it will make th the pot scratchy. It'll just mess up a lot of different things. Uh, and if, for those of you that don't know, any wire can um, is capable of carrying both an AC or an alternating current signal, like a guitar pickup signal is an electrical signal in an AC or alternating current format, and also a DC or a direct current signal at the same time. I don't really know how or why that works. It's just is kind of a cool thing about electricity. So this capacitor, one of the properties of a capacitor is it decouples DC. So it blocks the direct current, which is in the middle of the circuit, from moving into the input and going up to the backwards into the input jack. So you need to have an incapacitor, input capacitor there to block that DC voltage. Now, the value that you pick also has some importance and some effect on the tone of your, of your distortion box. This is a 0.1 UF, which is a pretty moderate sized capacitor. It actually will work with some of the other components like, or even like the resistance on your guitar pickup and in your cable um, and with some of the other components in here to form um, a, a high pass filter. High pass meaning highs are allowed to pass and lows get shunted to ground. Now if you use a very large value, maybe one UF or higher, that basically means all of the frequencies are going to pass because the low, the high pass frequency cutoff point is going to be ridiculously low, like like one hertz or something. And when you set it at 0.1 UF, that's a little bit more moderate. You probably want a little bit of high pass filtering going on just to help remove oscillations or low rumbles or things like that. So 0.1 UF is a really nice value for that. Now, you could also potentially use a even lower value capacitor. Let's say if you use like a 0 0.001 microfarad capacitor, that would shelve quite a lot of low frequencies. Possibly if you get that, that filter moving up more into the like two, three, four hundred hertz range, 
you're you're basically turning this potentially into a treble booster. So if you wanted this pedal to be brighter or to be more mid-rangey, then you could experiment with the value of C1 and and make it uh, more instead of more of a full range boost, make it more of a uh, mid mid or treble boost. Okay. Next we come to this R1 2.2 meg. This bridges the uh, collector to the base. This is primarily responsible for helping to bias this capa this uh, circuit. Now the value being so large, it's also possible that so we got our signal comes in, goes through this capacitor. Seeing 2.2 megs here, it's not going to travel up this way and bypass. It's going to go into the base of the transistor. Coming out though, it's possible some of it could go back as like a negative feedback loop. But um, I think given the value there, 2.2 uh, meg is a really really high amount of resistance. Almost all of it is just going to continue on down the circuit. Now on the emitter, we have a resistor of 680 ohms. Uh, this resistor also helps to stabilize and bias the transistor. It helps set the gain as well. And um, now the value of this resistor, and really this, the R3, R2, and R1, all of them are kind of tailored specifically to this transistor, the 2N3904. Two all three of them work together really to set the voltage, set the gain, set the bias kind of as a unit to make sure that the transistor is amplifying to the fullest extent that it's capable, but not too much that it's clipping so hard, um, but not too little that it's kind of leaving performance on the table. You know, if you think about the idle of your car, you, know, you usually want it idling, you know, somewhere between like, I don't know, like 0.5 and 1 or whatever. You know, I'm not a car expert, but if it idles too low, it might kind of peter out and die when you're at a stop sign you don't want that but if it's idling too high then it's kind of running too hot and you're wasting gasoline so in the same way you want your circuit to be kind of idling in the proper level and so that's what these these resistors do the 47k here on the collector also brings in our nine volt so uh connection so we have uh, positive nine volts here coming from our power supply in uh to the collector to provide that high voltage <clears throat> now um, again, the transistor here is mostly functioning as a clean boost at this point. Um, we've got another C2 coupling capacitor, same as C1, just on the output, same exact function. We've got DC here that we need to decouple or block from passing out the circuit, specifically like if it got onto this pot, it would make it all scratchy and it would just do um, yucky things that we don't want. So we block it with this capacitor. Also the value, if you make it a larger value, you basically allow full frequencies and then the lower, the smaller the value you make it, the more you will um, block low-end frequencies and allow highs to pass. So right in here, we basically just have an audio amplifier. So this really isn't too different than an LPB1 booster. And I have a whole video where I went deep in on that and actually kind of talked about the similarities between the LPB1 and the Electra. But then where it gets interesting here is on the output of this boost, we have these two diodes. Now these diodes are... Um, shunted to ground so what that means is the, the one of the diodes is going to handle the positive waveforms so again we think of your alternating current signal and if uh, the you know in the middle is your zero anything that goes above the middle is positive anything that goes below the middle is negative everything that's going positive is being handled by one of these diodes and everything that's negative is being handled by the second diode and then depending on the forward voltage of each of these diodes uh, that will determine the level at which the signal will start to clip and, and exceed the threshold of that diode and clip so it can pass and then be shunted to ground. Um, and so, uh, yeah, w you know, the, the type of diode that you choose is actually really impactful because different diodes have different levels of forward voltage. And so they start clipping at different times. So if you know anything about like a compressor, you usually have a threshold level for where the compressor, compressor is going to kick in. And once the signal gets loud enough, it reaches the threshold. And then at that point, the compressor is going to start working. These diodes are kind of similar. And using different types of diodes, it's like setting the threshold at a different level. And so you can experiment. For example, like a germanium diode might have like a 0.3 of a volt Whereas a silicon dial like this might have a 0.7 of a volt or an LED might have be like two volts. And so um, that, that will affect their sound. You know, a, a germanium dial with a very low forward voltage will start to clip and compress the signal very quickly. But then also just the nature of the germanium means that it will probably also be a very soft knee. It's not a hard square wave type clipping. It's more of a soft gradual clipping. So even though the threshold is low, or the forward voltage is low, 
it, it kind of still kind of allows some of it to go through because maybe it's a little bit inefficient. It's an older technology, germanium. Whereas a silicon diode, like I've got listed here as a 1N418, might have more of a moderate forward voltage. And then when it does clip, it's kind of more of a hard clipping. And then, like I said, an LED, that might have the highest forward voltage of all at 2 volts. But, um, you know, when it clips, it, it also clips with kind of more of a rock and roll crunch square wave type distortion. But also, because the forward voltage is so high, it ends up feeling very open and not very compressed. So the, the types of diodes that you use are very critical. One thing you can also do is, if I copy uh, this, you can set another diode and move the ground like, oh, we're going to do this actually. Get rid of this connection and redo this. So if you set it up in this manner, you may have heard about symmetrical and asymmetrical clipping. The first example was an example of symmetrical clipping. Symmetrical meaning there's symmetry between these two diodes. They both exist and the positive and negative waveforms are being treated equally. On the flip side, you have asymmetrical clipping. So you basically add a second diode in series and leave one diode on this side. So in this example, all three of these diodes are the same, but we have two on the negative waveform and one on the positive. That basically when you have two of them, it will change the forward voltage. And so um, let's say that, for example, if the positive waveforms are, are allowed to go up to 0.7 volt and then it kicks in, but then the negative waveform maybe is like 0.4. And actually, to be honest with you, I don't know if adding two diodes, if that doubles or halves the forward voltage, that maybe if you know the answer to that, please leave a comment down below. I just know that it changes the forward voltage so that your positive waveforms and your negative waveforms are clipping at different levels. They're not clipping the same. And so that kind of creates some interesting uh, changes the way the harmonics are generated and, and, and changes the character of the distortion. I know that you know, typically you think of tube distortion, like in your tube amplifiers, they often have asymmetrical type of clipping. And so um, something that we can play around with. So it comes out of these uh, this connection point with these diodes and it goes into a 100K pot uh, that's a master volume control into the output. That's the circuit, it is simple as can be. So what are the things we can play around with? Well, we already talked about these capacitors the values, um, I'm probably going to favor a little bit of high pass filtering, but not too much. I want it to be pretty full range, but I do want a little bit of tightening. So 0.1 UF is usually pretty good, but I might experiment maybe even with a 0.01. Uh, I, I know if you go to 0.001, then it starts to really get more trouble boostery. And I don't really want that. It's also possible you could even put these on a switch. So for example, you could add like another capacitor right here like this. And I've got my kind of input going into a switch here. Let's say maybe set this one to 0.001 UF. You know, then you can kind of switch between the two, have a treble boost mode and a kind of a full range mode. That would be kind of interesting. It's also possible you could change the transistor. Um, I may experiment with a 2N5088, which is a little bit of a higher gain, more modern, slightly newer uh, transistor. It has more potential output. Um, you're going to have to change these biasing resistors, most likely R3 and R2, to kind of uh, fit in with that a little bit better. And you could experiment a lot with the diodes. Uh, you could put both of the diodes on a switch, uh, which would go from boost mode to kind of fuzz mode. You can put a switch, like you could have these two in the circuit, but you could put a switch in here to allow this asymmetrical clipping on a switch. You could even put some resistance between the end of the diodes and ground, or even put a pot there. So you kind of make it instead of more of this is kind of more of a hard clipping. You can make it feel like more of a soft clipping because you're adding some resistance to these diodes. Um, one other thing that I've sometimes have seen being done is taking a capacitor and putting it here on kind of the output of this resistor on the emitter. And that kind of serves as like a cathode bypass cap from a tube amp is what I think of. And you could even put like it on a pot. So instead of just bypassing it entirely, you could put a put the wiper of the pot to be this cap. So the, the wiper of the pot basically determines how much of the resistance gets the capacitor or not. And you can kind of use that as like a gain control. Um, so 
a lot of different and fun options to play around with. I'm going to stop here. I'm going to go ahead and try to build this thing on the breadboard, and we're going to play around with a bunch of these things and see how it sounds. Let's dive in.